thanks everyone for joining our second uh, political <laughs> Polycon UK webinar. Today we are going to have uh, Noam uh, from LSE who is going to talk about uh, data intensive innovation and the state, um, which is joint work with Martin uh, Beracha and uh, Daniel Yang. So before I hand over to Noam, just let me remind you that um, these webinars take place every two weeks on Mondays at 3 p.m. UK. And in two weeks, we will have, uh, I think, Dan Bernard uh, from Warwick. And as usual, you can find more information uh, on our website and also uh, we're on Twitter. So uh, if you want updates, you can follow us there. Uh, so the format of the seminar is going to be uh, as follows. We're gonna have a 50 minutes presentation. Um, we're going to, if you have any clarifying question, uh, feel free to write it in the chat and we will monitor the chat and interrupt Noam uh, as needed for clarifying questions. And then we're going to have 10 minutes at the end for uh, a Q and A. So we ask, uh, everyone to keep your microphones muted and cameras turned off, but uh, you can ask the questions via the chat. And um, this is it. So uh, thanks, Noam. Uh, you have uh, the floor now. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, I will share my screen and get this onto full screen mode. Okay, can everybody see this? Uh, yes. Great. Um, so yeah, this is a paper called Data Intensive Innovation in the State Evidence from AI Firms in China with Martin and David. Um, and, and we really like to thank a team of, of research assistants that we have um, who collected data for us and also um, were, were able to produce some artificial intelligence that, that we applied um, to, to generate our data. Um, and we couldn't have done this without them. So we appreciate them very much. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, the, the broad motivation for, for this project was, was sort of aimed at trying to understand um, AI innovation. Um, the, this is a set of technologies, artificial intelligence, um, that I think many people agree at least holds the potential to transform the world. Um, everything from businesses um, to labor markets, to society as a whole, um, in the same way that, that during the Industrial Revolution, machines replaced human and animal power, um, the, the current AI um, innovation revolution has a potential to replace humans' cognitive power um, and therefore sort of reshape economies um, in, in dramatic ways, in ways that maybe we still haven't um, fully appreciated. Um, so understanding this, this area of innovation is super important. Um, and maybe the first thing that, that you realize as you begin to study AI innovation is that it's not all about sort of programming better. It's not all about developing better algorithms. Um, although there are some, some you know, incredibly deep and important sort of modeling and conceptual advances that, that have made um, AI take off and, and become you know, a, a much more prominent sort of commercial technology today. Um, and, and that's kind of discussed in, in Sainowski and, and sort of the, one of the big conceptual steps was, was sort of known as the deep learning revolution. Um, deep learning works um, when, when computer scientists have access to big data. Um, and so it's no accident that, that, you know, alongside the rise of AI has been the rise of big data and data analytics um, as, as a field of, of interest. Um, so many of the major advances um, in AI have, have occurred not only because of, of improved algorithms or improved sort of technological capacity to process data, uh, but just the, the mere fact of, of huge data sets becoming available have, have played a crucial role. So AI innovation um, and the development of new AI technologies is, is data intensive. Um, so in this paper, we ask sort of a, a pretty basic question and, and you know, we'll get a little bit narrower than this, um, but, but broadly we ask what determines the rate um, and direction of, of innovation in a data intensive economy. Um, and, and our answer is, is that at least part of um, the, the story is going to be a crucial role of the state. Um, and that's gonna arise from two features of data um, that, that we think sort of interact in, in a particular way um, to, to shape uh, innovation in data intensive economies. So the, the first is that states are key collectors of data and holders of data. Um, and, and this is you know, seen you know, very basically in, in the root of the word statistic um, being the word state. Um, so states have, have always historically been holders of, of data. This is you know, the, the part of the function of the state um, is to, to make it legible and, and um, use data 
um, to provide services and also to collect revenues, of course. Um, in addition to, to collecting a, a range of data, um, states are, are also sort of in the, in the business of, of collecting particular types of data for, for the provision of, of public security. So states um, monitor um, their populations and, and today that takes the form of a, a sort of data collection, which is surveillance um, data, video data and, and, and picture data. Um, for the provision of public security. Um, and states also um, are involved in, in the, the sort of market for data um, and, and collection and transmission of data, even in settings where, where you don't think of the state being sort of the primary player. Um, and, and that is in, in the, the regulation and distribution of data. So, you know, you might sort of start by saying, okay, you know, states are, are the main possessors of, of, let's say, public security data through, through state-owned surveillance cameras. Maybe states are the primary possessors of, of satellite data, um, but are states really sort of crucial players in, in markets for like search data on the internet? And the answer is, well, right now, you know, especially in the US, they're not a crucial player, um, but implicitly they are in the sense that they've assigned property rights over those data to, to companies like Google um, to do essentially whatever they want with. Um, but you know, to some extent that's a status quo and it's not really an active choice of the state, but, but it's becoming more and more of an active choice and a, and a position of debate. So states are involved even in data markets where, where they're not such active collectors. Um, in addition to, to that you know, key role of the state, um, data have a, a, a particular characteristic, which is that, that they can be used in, in different ways within a certain firm. Um, so they can be shared you know, between a, a government oriented use and, and a private use. That is, there, there can be economies of scope um, in, in engagement, particularly with state data. And so what we have in mind here is that the, the sort of data that's used to produce a, a state service, let's say helping a state um, make predictions about people based on public security cameras, those same sorts of predictions can be inputs into commercial software as well. And just to, to bring it a little bit closer to home, um, for economists, um, the example that, that we think about is like if, if a, an applied economist gets access to census data or IRS data or social security administration data um, and produces some sort of service uh, for the state, cleaning the data, conducting some sort of um, policy analysis or something like that, um, if that economist is, is able, they will also use that very same data typically to write sometimes a very large number um, of papers for their own private purposes. And, and that sort of economy of scope, being able to use government data to, to produce government services, but then at the same time um, produce perhaps a large number of, of private products as well, means that, that the, sort of the, the state and its data um, can, can play a, a crucial role in, in private sector commercial innovation as well. Um, and so what we do in the project is we start by just formalizing these two features of data, sort of the, the role of the state um, as a major collector of data um, and, and potential economies of scope from sharing uh, government data across uses and potentially using it for commercial innovation. We put those in a partial equilibrium model um, and the model generates a, a very simple set and maybe obvious set of comparative statics, um, namely that, that greater access to government data can lead not only or will lead not only um, to more government software production, but also to more commercial software production. Um, and we test that comparative static prediction or those comparative static predictions um, in the context of what we think of as like a prototypical data intensive sector, which is facial recognition AI in China. Um, so we collect rich data on, on facial recognition AI firms um, and on Chinese government contracts. We combine those data, and I'll tell you more about that, um, and, and find you know, very simply that, that our, our simple model's predictions um, are confirmed. When, when a, a Chinese facial recognition AI firm gets access to more government data, they increase both government and commercial software. Um, and and when, we, when we look kind of closely at contracts that vary in the amount of, uh, of data that, that firms get access to, um, access to more government data um, really drives more government and commercial software production, providing evidence of these economies of scope. Um, and then something that I'll only touch on in, in this presentation, it's not my own comparative advantage um, uh, among the, the, the set of co-authors or, or absolute advantage, let's be clear. Um, it, we, uh, we, we embed the, the partial equilibrium analysis um, within a general equilibrium model um, and start thinking about like 
what, what are the, the macro implications for, for innovation um, of, of the economies of scope that we identify empirically. And so we, we first sort of model what um, these economies of scope will look like on a balanced growth path. And then we think about some, some exercises uh, uh, involving the role of the state in, in different ways. So one is data-driven industrial policy. Um, another is a, a surveillance state that demands AI um, to produce you know, monitoring. Um, and, and a third is data regulation. And, and it turns out that, that sort of the data-driven industrial policy application um, in some ways sheds light on, on the other two. So I'll very briefly talk about, about that one. Um, the, the punchline is that, that when the, the economies of scope are as strong as, as what we find in our, in our empirical setting, um, the macro implications of, of these economies of scope um, and the role of the state in, in generating these economies of scope through the data that it collects and provides to firms um, play a, a really significant role in, in determining the direction of technical change and, and also in determining the growth rate of the economy. So why is this kind of valuable within, within the, the economics literature? Well, we think it, it's valuable in a few ways. Um, so first, um, there's a growing literature on AI, um, given you know, the, the you know, seeming importance of, of this, this sector. It's unsurprising that there's a lot of work uh, that, that studying AI, both its implications and, and how sort of the economics of AI might be different um, from, from economics, you know, forces in, in other settings. Um, what, what we add to that literature is, is really an emphasis on the role of the state um, and, and these potential economies of scope um, that, that arise from, from state data. Um, we, we also add to, to the literature on, on industrial policy and innovation policy um, which, which is, you know, a small empirical literature um, that, that is, is beginning to get, you know, sort of more and more identified empirical work. Um, and, and to that literature, you know, we, we think we, we contribute, you know, first just by, by studying a particularly important technology. Um, so among all the, all the, the, the settings that you might want to study to think about industrial policy and the role of the state, we think AI policy um, is, is potentially an important one. Um, and, and in addition, we, we highlight a, a mechanism um, that hasn't really been studied in the literature. So, so we have this particular uh, source of economies of scope arising from the transfer of data across uses from a government purpose to a private purpose um, that, that you know, we, we're able to you know, not perfectly document, um, but, but I think we, we have suggestive evidence of that mechanism. Um, and then in, in the case of our, of our uh, macro model and, and the evaluation of industrial policy, um, we, I think, generate some, you know, sort of surprising results, at least to us, um, and, and in particular, emphasizing the, the role of government data and government policy um, in, in shaping technical change, both the level and, and direction of technical change, um, much more than, than um, sort of traditional industrial policy that might be focused on, on subsidies. Um, uh, to, to, you know, so, so we also contribute to a literature on directed technical change. Um, that, uh, that literature, you know, began in, in a very theoretical vein. Um, and, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm being, getting a, a knock at the door, which is just, you know, the usual, um, at home seminar situation. I can't tell if it's truly urgent. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll keep going for now. Um, so, so this, this, this traditionally more, more theori theoretical literature on directed technical change um, has seen empirical applications. A lot of those are, are in, in the energy area and pharmaceuticals, and, and we kind of add a, a new application. Um, and then finally, sort of maybe closest to, to our hearts as political economists, um, in addition, I guess, to the industrial policy questions, um, is, is this question of, of autocracy and, and innovation. Um, which, which was very much in our minds when we started working on this topic. And, and that is like sort of the, the puzzle that, that China is among the world's leaders in developing AI technologies. Um, and it's, it's hard to, to really uh, sort of rationalize that given uh, a large literature that emphasizes auto, autocratic taxes um, on innovation and especially frontier innovation. Um, we, we helped to understand that, I think, um, by pointing to a particular autocratic advantage, um, which, which arises from autocracy's collection of, of large amounts of data for monitoring purposes. 
Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, this, this simple model, um, just so you get a sense. I, it's not going to be anything surprising. Um, but but what, what, we're, what we have in mind um, is a firm that, that produces software for the government. Um, it uses government data to do that, DG, um, as well as other inputs. The firm also can produce commercial or private software, QP. Um, importantly, it can use both government data and private data um, to do that. Uh, sort of the, the, the key assumption that we make, um, which I think is, is reasonable in many settings, is that you, you need government data to produce government software, um, government AI services, and, and certainly in the setting that we study where firms are, are basically providing facial recognition services um, to the government, they're doing that by, by using surveillance data that, that the state possesses. Um, and, and in addition, um, the, the firms that, that hope to use government data um, to produce private or commercial software um, are only able to do to, to get access to that government data by producing government software. Um, and so again, like, you know, that's not always the case. Government software, sorry, government data um, is, is made available in some cases publicly and, and freely. Um, but, but in many cases, it, it's actually true that, that firms actually need to engage with the government and provide some service um, to the state in order to get access to its data. So, so this is kind of the, the working sort of assumption in, in our model. Um, and, and in this model, there, there's an elasticity that captures the economies of scope, which is sigma. Um, and, and what you would expect to see is what, what you see in this model, which is as the economies of scope increase, um, you get a, a larger marginal product um, of government data in producing private software. So there's this spillover. You produce government software, you get access to this government data by producing that government software and getting access to that government data. It actually makes you more productive also in, in producing private software. Um, it's worth noting that, that you know, it's, it's not obvious that when you produce government software, you're going to start producing more uh, commercial software as well. And in fact, like, you know, maybe the baseline assumption should be that, that there will be some amount of crowding out, actually. Um, and, and so I, I would say, while this is a very simple model, it's not the case that its predictions are, are at all sort of empirically obvious. Um, so if you want to put um, a, a little bit of, of a functional form on this, um, you, can, you can derive a, a very nice bound for the sigma parameter, the economy of scope parameter, um, which ends up being important in the macro model. So I'm not going to talk about that very much today, but, but just to say that, that um, our comparative statics are, are actually um, very general, like they'll, they'll arise from, from models of, of, you know, with, with different production functions. But if you make some, some of these simplifying assumptions, um, then you get a very nice form for this sigma. Um, and that in, in the, the paper that we're working on, um, we make those assumptions and then plug that, the, the sort of resulting um, sigma that we estimate or the bound on sigma that we estimate um, from our empirical setting into the macro model um, based on these assumptions. Um, but, but very simply, what we'll take to the data um, is a comparative static based on a change in access to government data. So imagine that you get some change in, in DG, um, an exogenous increase in access to government data. Um, what do we expect to see? Well, we expect to see an increase um, in government software production, which, which you know, comes out of, out of this relationship here. Um, and, and also, again, like working against a crowding out story, you get an increase in private or commercial software production as well. Um, and that response will be stronger. This, the, the larger is sigma, this, this economy of scope elasticity. Um, so that's what we're going to take to, to our study of facial recognition AI firms in China. So, so I, why are we, sorry? We have a clarifying question yeah, yeah, in, the, in the chat, which I think is going to be a good uh, segue into the empirical investigation. So uh, Jeremy Dietmar is uh, basically asking to what extent, um, so the, to what extent we can actually disentangle in the empirical uh, analysis, I think access to data as a productivity enhancing input versus access to data as a marker of uh, political factors. So just the fact we'll, that you can we'll get there. Uh, yeah. you just, just be patient. <laughs> um, and, and I say that with love. Um, so, okay. Um, so the, the, you'll, you'll see very soon. Um, in, in China, you have sort of a, a very, I, I would say, representative or, or almost stylized relationship um, between private firms producing AI services um, and a state demanding those services 
um, in order to produce sort of a, a, a particular government good, which is surveillance. Um, so facial data um, that can be linked to administrative records on individuals are possessed in very large quantities by, by the Chinese government. Um, and these sorts of data are exactly what's crucial to train facial recognition algorithms, um, both if you want to make predictions about people to provide public services um, and uh, if you want to produce uh, commercial predictions, let's say, about, about the retail sector or, or consumer behavior. Um, in this sector, there's significant state engagement. Um, and uh, that that stating with the private sector. Um, so there's there's a separate set of questions of like the make or buy question. Um, is it the case um, that, that the Chinese government ought to be, you know, producing these sorts of services in house? Um, and, and why is it the case that it engages so much with the private sector? I'll just say it, it does. Um, and I think those are fascinating questions maybe to talk about later. Um, the particular mechanism that we have in mind, again, kind of captures a mechanism that we think is much more general, um, but the state demands AI software, again, from the private sector for surveillance or monitoring. Private firms will provide software to the government, um, and, and in so doing, in providing, let's say, a set of predictions to the government, they get access to government data um, on which they train their algorithms. Um, once they train those algorithms, um, the improved algorithms can then be used um, as, as a component of a commercial product. So, so a very simple version of this is like, think about, about a lot of AI, um, especially with facial recognition, is maybe having kind of two layers. Um, one layer is a layer of, uh, of, of sort of detection or identification. Who is this person that I see in a camera? And the second might be making a prediction about that person. Um, that first detection or identification stage is, is certainly enhanced by getting access to, to a large number of surveillance cameras. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is what we're thinking of as, as sort of the first step. And, and it might be the case that, that in producing um, government software, there's another second step where, where the firm might also be making predictions for the state about who's likely um, to produce some undesirable social activity. Um, but then that very same well-trained detection algorithm can just as easily be used in, in a, a shopping mall to identify a person and then add on a layer of, of a different prediction, which might be who's likely to spend a lot of money, who's likely to respond to a sale offer or whatever. Um, so, so this is a sense in which like the economies of scope are, are very natural um, in, in this setting. Um, and this is sort of what the, the detection stage looks like, um, is just people passing through camera screens and, and you need to be able to match these people, you know, taken at different angles, um, taken very rapidly and, and match them sort of end to end um, with, with administrative records. Um, so this is, you know, we'll, we'll get to, to Jeremy, Jeremy's question soon, I promise. Sorry, it, it, it's a few more slides. So before, before getting to, to the identification question, um, which, which is, you know, at the heart of what, what he asks about, um, there's a data question, which, which I want to talk about first. And, and sort of the, th this we split into three parts. Um, one is um, data sets, um, that, that link an AI firm to a government contract, which is sort of our source of variation in data, um, that didn't exist, um, nor was there systematic evidence on, on software and, and sort of let alone um, detailed information on, on the nature of the software. Is it intended for government purpose um, or for a commercial purpose? Um, and, and in addition, and, and I guess this, this also relates to Jeremy's question, which is like, how do you measure access to government data? Um, I've started by hinting at like, we're using contracts um, as, as a starting point for, for our proxy for government data. But, but as, as Jeremy's point suggests, like contracts come with many other things. Um, and so we're gonna have an indirect measure of access to government data. Um, and, and I'll tell you about that shortly. But, but here, here come the identification questions. Um, first, contracts are assigned in a non-random way. We have to deal with that. And then contracts work through other mechanisms and, and add to, to financing, um, political connections, signaling, and so on. Um, so how do we solve these problems? So first, we identify facial recognition AI firms um, from a source called Tianyan Cha. It comes from the, the People's Bank of China. Um, we do some cross-checking with PitchBook, which is a database of, of sort of early stage um, high-tech firms. Um, and, and we have, you know, I, I think very comprehensive, I don't want to say we have the universe of firms, but we have very comprehensive coverage. Um, 
I, we say universe, I, I always I get so nervous saying universe, but um, in particular with Chinese data, um, one worries a little bit, um, but we have a, a very comprehensive source um, of government procurement contracts. Um, so this is something that, you know, anytime I give a talk, I, I suggest that people um, look into it. It's, it's a remarkable data set. It's, it's huge. It has like, you know, 3 million contracts that we've collected um, that, that are all contracts or close to all contracts um, since 2015. Um, and, and the Chinese Ministry of Finance has posted these. And, and there's some sense that they're, they're pretty good data um, in that there's been a very strong sort of anti-corruption push and this has been part of that. Um, the, the government contract data um, tell us the time of the contract, um, which is crucial, the products and services that are contracted on, the monetary size of the contract, which is what allow us um, to control for, for the size of the contract potentially playing some role. Um, the supplier, which is the, the AI firm, um, and, and the buyer, which is going to be um, some government agency. Um, how about software? So, um, sorry, checking the time. Okay. Um, so so the, the Chinese Ministry of, uh, of Industry and Information Technology requires that Chinese firms register their new software products. Um, and so we are able to get, again, like comprehensive data on, on new software products produced by Chinese facial recognition AI firms. Um, we're able to, to get some sense of how comprehensive this is by looking at the IPO prospectus of, of sort of the largest Chinese facial recognition company, this is MegV. Um, so, so far, this is, there, there haven't been any IPOs of these facial recognition AI firms, um, but, but MegV um, issued a prospectus and, and we're able to, to check the software products that are listed there against our list and all of the, the listed software in the prospectus um, is in our data. Um, we categorize the software by intended customers, um, government commercial, um, or, or sort of hard to define or more general. Um, we, we have that, that general category in order to, to sort of be conservative in our classification of commercial software. Um, we, of course, do some of this by hand, and then we have um, our amazing RAs um, predict um, a larger range of, of contracts intended user. Um, that that uh, AI model is, is this recurrent neural network model. Um, all I can really say about it is, you know, having done some, you know, more amateur reading about, uh, about machine learning and AI, um, is that this is quite frontier. Um, and, and in addition, we've asked our, our RAs to, to sort of perturb these, these parameters in the learning model, and, and our results are, are actually really robust to that. Um, so, how to, how to measure access to government data. Um, and this, I, I think, you know, it's, it's both the hardest challenge. I think some of the coolest stuff we're doing is, is you know, in, in that area, but of course it's also imperfect. So let me tell you what we're able to do. So, so the starting point is coding contracts um, depending on the, the agency that issues the contract. So we start by, by looking at public security contracts um, versus non-public security contracts. We think of public security contracts as being data richer, while non-public security contracts would, would come with many of the other um, sort of political um, connections and tags and signals um, that, that um, you might worry about driving results um, beyond data. Um, so, so, you know, start by thinking about a comparison between public security contracts and non-public security contracts. And just, you know, what, what do we have in mind here? Um, you know, so public security contracts typically involve uh, contracting with a firm to analyze large databases of images um, and, and non-public security contracts, of course, these are all facial recognition AI firms, just to be clear. So why does a hospital or a school or a bank contract with a facial recognition AI firm? Um, usually to, to provide identification on, on a much smaller number of in, interested people. Um, and, and so, you know, really it's about, about data scale much more than it is about, about the nature of the product. So, so in the case of of you know this bank contract that that we highlight here, um, the the facial recognition AI firm is is providing sort of facial recognition services, um, but but based on a much smaller pool of people, the bank's clients rather than you know potentially thirty million people um, who are who are in the public sphere. Um, now the next layer that I think is even cooler is is within the set of public security contracts. We're going to look at at contracts that are that are data richer and, and contracts that are data more data scarce, and that's arising from um, the, the, the public security agencies passed contracts um, to, to procure public security cameras. 
Um, so, so think about, you know, what is a facial recognition AI firm getting access to? Typically what they're getting access to is, is a large number of images. That's what helps you train your algorithm. How do you get a large number of images? Well, instead of just happening to, to contract with a, with a police force that has a small number of cameras, you contract with a, with a, uh, a police force that has a large number of cameras um, at the time of the contract. And so we, we, again, use our same procurement contract database um, to identify the, the, ca the, the contracts for street cameras um, and we'll code a high capacity uh, public security contract or a low capacity public security contract based on this. And so um, what you'll see um, in, in our empirical strategy is, is it will look at essentially a triple diff um, so I don't like the word placebo. We should replace placebo with falsification exercise uh, because we don't think that the other public security contracts are, are, um, are, are sort of, you know, true placebos. They shouldn't have no effect. Um, but, but we have in mind, you know, for the most part, a triple diff specification where, where what we're going to look at is the effect of getting a, a high capacity public security contract pre versus post versus a, a low capacity uh, public security contract pre versus post controlling for for time fixed effects and firm fixed effects. So what that looks like um, as as an empirical model um, is the following where we're going to predict firms software production government or commercial and we're going to control for firm and 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 year fixed effects and now what we're going to say is well you know time period by time period and these cap T's are going to be both before and after you get a contract there's going to be some software production before and after you get any public security contract. And then there's going to be potentially a differential effect of getting a data rich public security contract. So this interaction here is, is going to tell you relative to, to the effect, you know, post versus pre of getting any sort of public security contract, what's the effect of getting a data rich public security contract. And now finally, you know, beginning to speak really directly to, to Jeremy's question, like, how do we, how do we quote, know, although we don't quite know, but, but why are we confident that the, the effects that we're going to identify are really about data rather than about, let's say, political connections? Well, you know, to the extent that, that the political connections that you get um, are very similar, getting a public security contract um, in a place that happens to have a lot of cameras or a place versus a place that doesn't happen to have a lot of cameras, um, those things are going to be purged out in our triple diff. Um, so, you know, of course, not, not perfect, but, but we can, we can think about confounds, um, you know, and, and talk about them more, more soon. No, um, so related to this, there's an additional yes. uh, question from Ronnie Raisin, uh, and it's basically asking like, to what extent this is kind of a learning by doing mechanism, yep. in which case you would expect it to see in similar other like empirical applications like weapons or Totally. Um, no, no. And so, so I think we, we, so we think there's definitely some learning by doing, I'll, I'll, I'll have a little bullet point on that. Um, so we think, you know, in, in the overall effects that you're going to see, we think some component of it is coming from learning by doing, um, but we can control for the, the past production of software essentially uh, to account for how much you've done. And we still see some, some incremental effects as well that, that seems to be coming from the data. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, point taken. And, and so we're, we're, we're also sort of thinking about, you know, writing a different paper on, on the learning by doing component, which seems significant. And, um, and as, as said, sort of is more general than just, you know, data. Um, yeah, I, one, one other thing I'll say, uh, sort of building on, on Ariana's previous comments, um, we started looking at, at the type of software being that, that was produced after firms receive what we think of as a, as a data richer or data scarce public security contract. And it looks like firms are producing very similar types of software, um, regardless of, of whether the, the agency that they, that they get a contract from has a lot of security cameras or not. Um, but the firms that get the high capacity contracts um, are producing much more commercial software. And so, so to the extent that sort of they're doing similar things in, in the two settings, um, you might expect a lot of the learning by doing also to kind of be purged out um, uh, by, by making this triple diff comparison. Um, so um, how do we deal with non-random assignment? And, and there are some other things we can do, but um, firm fixed effects account for, for sort of fixed selection. Um, we can also take firm characteristics or sort of pre-contract firm characteristics, sort of flexibly interact them with, with time periods and let those characteristics 
um, have time varying effects doesn't doesn't really affect our results. Um, and and again, we we I think account for a lot of the selection process um, by by differencing out the the firms that are getting also public security contracts, but happening to get a public security contract in a place with fewer cameras. And and also just to be clear, um, we're able to control for for like time varying effects um, of of how rich. Uh, a, a prefecture is, for example. Um, so it isn't just the case that, that what we're capturing, and, and I'll talk about that in, in a second, I guess, in, in more detail, but, but previewing what I'll talk about in a minute, um, you know, it, it's not just the case that, that the high capacity places, the, the places with a lot of, of security co contracts are just richer places or bigger places or, or, or something like that. There's some correlation, um, but there's also independent variation. Um, so so here's, here's the other mechanism. So um, Obviously, you know, you might think contracts in, in places with a lot of security contracts might differ in other ways. Um, we can control for, for various contract characteristics interacted with time. Um, that doesn't sort of absorb our, 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 our effect of, of data. Um, we control for these market characteristics. Um, and then we can look again, more like a falsification exercise. What does an, a non-public security contract do um, in, in a high, high capacity place versus a low capacity place? Um, so, um, we'll, we'll look at, at, at that test shortly. Um, but, but in addition, I think one of the things that, that I just want to emphasize is that we also have a range of, of tests that are more constructive. So if you think that, that data is really playing like a key role here, as opposed to some of the other, um, you know, potential stories, um, then, then one of the first things you might look for is the production, not just of, of. AI software after you get a government contract, but also the production of data complementary software. And, and this is a, a reasonably large class of software that firms are producing. And so what this is, is basically database management software. Um, this is independent of the AI software that we code. Um, it's sort of, you know, sort of a, a functional classification that, that we asked our RAs to predict for us. Um, and so what we find, for example, is that firms getting data rich public security contracts are producing much more of this data complementary software in addition to more AI software. And among the firms that are producing, uh, or among the firms getting a, a data rich contract, the ones that produce data complementary software are also differentially producing uh, more commercial AI software as well, which is sort of a, a bunch of corroborating tests um, that seem to go the right way. Um, and, and again, we can sort of argue against other mechanisms, um, at least playing the, the complete role um, in, in explaining our patterns by, by, by just trying to, to evaluate them. And so, you know, in, in evaluating learning by doing, as I said, we're going to just control for, for lag production. Um, so here are our main results. Um, and let me just check my time. Okay. Um, so, so the first thing is, you know, what, what happens um, when, when you get uh, a government contract to your to your government software production and what, what we're going to plot here are the beta ones which is sort of the triple diff so all of this is is relative to the effect of getting a, a sort of low camera capacity uh public security contract and and just to be clear and and i could show you this you know separately after uh the talk um if you get a low capacity uh public security contract that's still good for you as a firm it's not the case that this is like you know, a positive effect, but it's about less crowding out or something like that. So if you get a, a low capacity contract, it's good for your government software production. It's also good for your commercial software production. You're getting access to more data. This is the differential effect um, of getting a contract in a place with a lot of cameras. Um, so there's a positive effect on government software production um, by three years after, you know, we see, you know, somewhere between two and three uh, new software products uh, produced differentially in, in these uh, high camera capacity places. Um, and when you look at commercial software production, you also see somewhere between two and, and two and a half um, new software products produced um, three years after a contract. And, and we don't see evidence of, of pre-trends um, sort of across a range of different specifications. So this is kind of our main result. You get a, a you know, increased government software production. Um, you don't get crowding out. In fact, you get more commercial software production um, as well, suggesting economies of scope. So what happens when you get a non-public security contract? So, so if you think that, that what's going on in a way is, let's say local, localities that, that are investing a lot in, in public security contract, sorry, in, in, in uh, public security cameras um, are also trying to push AI software development, let's say, and then you get a public security contract in this place, 
um, well, you're getting government connections and you're getting government connections in a place that's investing a lot in cameras, maybe getting any sort of government contract or any sort of government connections in, in a place that, that's buying a lot of cameras is going to, to generate these, these same sorts of patterns. Um, and so what, what you can see in, in the black and gray lines relative to, to the results we had before in blue is that if you get a non-public security contract in that, that happens to have a lot of, in, in a place that happens to have a lot of public security, con uh, sorry, a, a bunch of public security camera contracts, um, getting, getting a non-public security contract doesn't have the same effect. So basically the non-public security contracts where you don't get access to the surveillance camera database doesn't produce the same bang for your buck in terms of government software and definitely not on, on commercial software. And so here you see that in fact, you know, maybe what you might've expected in the baseline is that in fact, it seems like you, you're gonna get some crowding out actually um, in, in these places. Um, so what are these additional tests? So I've told you AI complementary software, um, like, you know, data storage type software um, and, and data management increases more when you get a, a data richer contract. Um, firms, um, you know, we, we try to rule out um, some, some sort of catch up story by, by controlling for, for firm characteristics interacted with, with time periods. Um, for example, we control for pre-contract software interacted with time, doesn't account for our results. Um, we, we try to evaluate different uh, alternative mechanisms through which contracts might work. Um, we control for the, the financial size of the contracts. Um, and we also look at second contracts instead of first to try to, to, try to rule out a, a signaling effect. Um, so what about learning by doing? Since, since Ronnie asked about this, I'll, I'll show this. Um, so, so essentially what, what you get when you control for um, lag production sort of in the opposite category, um, so to, to avoid issues of, of sort of lag dependent variable models, here we're looking at, at sort of commercial software production, controlling for lag government software production, um, and you still see um, sort of effects of, of getting a, a, a public security contract um, and a differential effect um, of, of getting a high capacity government software, uh, sorry, go, uh, public security contract. Um, so, so there is evidence of learning by doing. I think it explains part of what we, what we see, um, but it doesn't explain everything. Um, so um, let me talk to you very briefly about what this means sort of at, at a macro level. Um, so just to be clear, what, what we sort of have in mind um, is a world where, where data intensive innovation and, and AI technology sort of becomes widespread. So, so it's, you know, if, if AI technology becomes as important as many people think it will, um, that's kind of the world we're modeling. Um, and and we, we take advantage a little bit of our, of our micro data. Um, many of the parameters we have no really, no great idea about, um, but at least as, as I mentioned before, when we make these functional form assumptions, we can get a bound um, on the economies of scope parameter, which ends up being really important and, and which we actually have an estimate of. Um, so what do we have in the model? Um, it, it looks a lot like the Asimoglu Restud directed technical change model, um, but now we have these, these three uh, different intermediate sectors, um, private software, government software, and, and a non-software good. Um, private software and the non-software good get combined into a final household good. Um, and, and the government good actually isn't really an intermediate sector, but um, is, is a, a, a valued government good uh, sorry, the government software is an intermediate into producing the government good, which is surveillance. Um, and, and what we have in mind um, is a model where you have innovators producing different varieties. Um, and uh, what, what we'll see sort of is, is the same sort of technology that we hinted at before in the partial equilibrium model, um, where you need uh, government data to produce government software, and you only get government data um, if you produce uh, if, if you produce government output, if you produce government software. Um, and again, private software can use both um, private data and government data. Uh, Non-software only uses effort, but, but not data. Um, so the, the model of, of our market is there's, there's a private data market, there's a private data supplier as well. Um, and uh, there's again, no market for government data. Um, and as, as I mentioned, sort of the, the new varieties are modeled just like in, in Asimoglu's model. Um, on a, what we study is a balanced growth path equilibrium. Um, free entry means you have these, these zero profit conditions across different types of firms. Um, at the end, there are three types of firms, government and private software producers, 
firms that produce only private software, meaning they're, they're using only private data to produce private software um, and non-software producers. Um, and, and free entry implies that, that you end up with, with zero profits across um, conditions. Um, we think about uh, state policy in this world um, as, as involving sort of four dimensions. The, the state chooses how much government data to, to provide to innovators. It chooses some amount of, of the government good um, to purchase uh, or the government software to purchase in producing a government good G. It chooses a, a tax rate um, and then transfers. Um, the way we model the, the production of government data, uh, which again, it's, it's a, you, know, you might view it as strict, but I think it's, it's sort of reasonable, um, is that the more government surveillance G is produced, the more data DG um, is, is produced um, as, as a byproduct. Um, private data we think of as, as resulting from uh, private transactions. Um, so, so the bigger final output Y, the more private data is available. Um, as I said, you can think about different uh, sort of government actions in this world. Um, we think about data-driven industrial policy um, as either a, a government choice to provide more data to firms or as lowering the tax rate um, on, on data. Um, and so this one you can think about as subsidizing an input. Um, and this one you could think about more as like an active government policy of, of support um, by providing an input directly. Um, and, and it turns out that, that they end up you know, sharing features with other types of, of government policy. So states that demand a lot of surveillance, um, for example, autocracies or AI-tocracies, and that's Martin's uh, sort of brilliant phrasing, I think. Um, well, I know it's Martin's, I think it's brilliant. Um, they, these firms, the, sorry, these states collect a lot of, of uh, the surveillance good G. Um, it turns out that that works a lot like providing firms uh, with more data, little DG, um, and subsidizing uh, inputs into, into the data market, uh, in, in, into data intensive technology by subsidizing data in the data market looks a lot like um, data regulation uh, due to privacy concerns, which, which can look like a, a tax on data. Um, so, you know, the, the paper, see the paper, I, we're trying, I mean, it's, you know, I've, I've offered you something that you can't do here, but I hope soon, um, there, there are some quantitative exercises that, that are, are speculative, but, but interesting. Um, I'll just sketch out one here. Um, so, so, and, and this sketch also sort of raises the, the sort of surprising elements of what we find. So think about traditional industrial policy as subsidizing, uh, production or inputs. Um, the goal being to shift the direction of innovation um, toward, let's say, data intensive technology. Um, in this case, it's private software. Um, and of course, you want to in, potentially influence the growth rate. Um, it turns out that, that these different policies that, that uh, states can, can engage in um, vary in how effective they are, how expensive they are, um, and, and in some cases, um, how intentional they are. And, and the incidental policies can sometimes work better than intentional ones. Um, so a, a very intentional policy might be direct provision of government data. Um, a more indirect policy might be purchasing goods like surveillance and incidentally providing um, data to, to firms. And, and as Ronnie suggested, like defense spending um, has, has an element to this as well, uh, very much so. Um, and, and regulation of data ends up being similar to an incidental industrial policy as well. Um, sort of the, the really interesting result that we find is that sort of interventions on the government data side, for example, an increase in the government data provided to firms, another version of this would be collecting more, more surveillance data on the balanced growth path. Um, those types of interventions really significantly um, uh, change the direction of innovation uh, toward private software and can change the growth rate on the balanced growth path. It turns out that, that changing the tax rate in our baseline model, sort of subsidizing private data production, has no impact on either the direction of technical change or the growth rate. And that's coming from the fact that, that essentially there, there's a margin of firms that are producing private software using government data. That government data production is entirely independent of the private data market in our baseline model. And as long as that's true, what you get by subsidizing private data is just pushing firms on the margin of using both government and private data to pushing more firms toward using just private data. Uh, but it doesn't actually change the direction of technical change 
um, or the growth rate. In order to get the, the sort of interventions on the private data market to have an impact uh, on the balanced growth path, you need to, to have some interrelationship um, between the government data market and, and the private market, which, which is kind of interesting. And, and even when there is some interrelationship, it turns out that policies that, that are you know, more directly involving the government data side as opposed to the private market um, are much more effective. Um, so let me just conclude. Um, we, we study these two important dimensions of data that we think jointly um, make the state a particularly important player in determining the rate of, of technical change and the direction of technical change in the modern world. One, that, that states collect a lot of data and hold it. Um, and two, that, that data can be shared across uses in the firm, generating economies of scope from government production to, to private production. Um, our empirical evidence suggests that these economies of scope are really meaningful. Um, and, and finally, sort of the, the big political economy speculation um, is, is that um, it may be the case that, that China is, is not sort of innovating despite autocratic institutions, um, but at least in this case, it's able to generate technical change, at least in part as a result of autocratic institutions. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Noam. Very, this is very interesting. So we have um, a couple of questions uh, that came up actually early on in the talk, uh, but I think our, uh, it would be really great to ask them now. So uh, Arthur, do you want to ask uh, your question? Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. It was a very interesting talk. The, the, the question I had is actually not very relevant because it was just to mention in your talk, you mentioned the fact that the state was a key provider of property rights and I do not believe that this is actually central to your story. Your story is more about learning by doing trade secret complementary between the state and some firms and the fact that there are large economies of scope, which is very specific to, your, to the industry that you're studying. But overall, it was very interesting. And I just wanted at the beginning to say that it was not about property rights, which is not very relevant now. So thank you very yeah, much. I mean, the one thing I would say, just, just to note, though, I mean, I, I think the property rights point is more, more you know, sort of, laying out an agenda, maybe also for, for others. I have no idea if we're going to go in this way. Um, but, but just to say that, that the role of the state isn't limited to these economies of scope, I think. That, that like, the role of the state could be massive if the state chooses to engage in, in some of these restrictions or changing the property rights or something. But yeah, it's not, not part of our story. I, one more thing I'll, I'll just note. And, and again, this is you know, something we've thought about a little bit, um, but, but also just for, for others um, to think about. But like, the, the, it, I, I think it's not just in facial recognition AI that you see sort of the state as, as a primary collector and holder of certain types of data that then can be productive for, for firms in, in commercial applications. So the example that I like to give is like the NHS contract um, with Amazon Alexa. So, so the NHS signed a deal with Amazon so that Amazon Alexa um, AI is being used to, to analyze you know, the UK's health data. Um, potentially good for, for the UK, you know, potentially good for UK citizens to have this AI at work for us. Um, I, I think there are definitely some advantages, um, but, but it's also the case that Amazon is, is getting huge advantages. Like that, the NHS data aren't, you know, broadly available to firms. Amazon has access to it. They're training their algorithms. Those, those algorithms are going to be valuable outside of the UK. Um, and, and so I, I think sort of similar processes are at work in other settings too. As a tiny note, and I think your paper is going to be the second that I'm going to cite on this topic, there is a paper in the North, Northwestern University uh, Law Review that mm -hmm. already addresses topics related to yours. Uh, I cited it in the chat, you might be interested. Oh, amazing, amazing. Yeah, I didn't look at the chat at all, so in case anybody sent fine message, but yeah, let me, let me see. Um, I, I will look at the chat. I will share it with you. Can you please? Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. You can like extract that. I, I appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you. Okay. So Ronnie uh, also had questions. Uh, Ronnie, do you want to ask them now? Hi, Noam. Hey. I'm not sure I remember what my question was. Uh, I think they were related <laughs> always to the kind of the role of the state versus the private sector. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess I was, uh, you know, trying to go to the primitives and understanding why I mean, you're making the case that authoritarian regimes have kind of an advantage, at least when it comes to AI. And I guess it's because of uh, the need for, uh, in, in some sense, that they need to, to do more security. And uh, well, so I, I, I guess, I, but I would, so, so I think, well, we, so 
I mean, I, I think the like exploring different versions of this is is super interesting. And so, you know, at some point we start we really started the paper thinking about um, sort of autocratic states and AI. And and you know, obviously Chinese facial recognition being sort of a prototypical example of that. But then the the more we talk about the idea, the more people kind of said, like, look, the state's collection of, of surveillance data has, you know, goes way beyond autocracy and, and other motives exist as well. Um, and so, you know, start by being general and, and then you could think about sort of the political economy aspect. So, so the, what, what we've thought about is, is you know, sort of first, um, at least is it possible that some element of autocracy might be conducive to, to AI innovation. And so the one that we think about is, you know, one is sort of the need for, for you know, monitoring, let's say to preserve stability um, and, and to preserve control. And so, you know, if you have that need sort of added on to, to the other elements in a government's objective function, that need by itself in our model will produce technical change directed toward software and more rapid growth on the balanced growth path. And so, like, as you say, like that need by itself, does, you know, as, as a, a, a very reduced form parameter, um, if you think autocracies have it, um, that will work. Um, now, not every autocracy will have it for sure. And so it's also interesting to think about which autocracies might choose sort of a, a sort of surveillance state strategy for maintaining power versus, versus other strategies. Um, that, that's something we've thought some about um, and, and, you know, sort of the, the other side that I think is interesting in terms of m more like the, the primitives, I would say, is like sort of solving the commitment problem. Um, and what is it about these AI firms um, that maybe, you know, align incentives in, in a way that, that resolves sort of commitment problems on both sides? So, so why is it the case that these AI firms believe that the state won't expropriate them? Um, why is it the case that the state believes that tech firms won't become powerful enough to unseat them? Um, what is it about sort of the alignment of, of these interests, you know, in the long enough run that, that they, they maintain this partnership? Um, and there, I think, you know, there, there are different elements I think are pretty interesting, um, ranging from sort of this make-buy problem that I, I brought up earlier. So, so why is it the state, why is it that the state is relying so much on the private sector um, I think there's an element of like allocation of talent um, that that's relevant here. There's a lot of talent in the private sector um, that the state wants access to. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I think it's fascinating. I, and, and no, no, I agree. I mean, another, another aspect of this is, which is I think uh, unique to China is the mixing of private and government. People rotate between government positions and- But, but I'll, I'll tell you like- For AI firms. As another example, though, that, that I think, again, like hits very close to, to my old home um, is, is Silicon Valley. And so if you if you read like Shoshana Zuboff's book, I think is where I came across this. But like there's there's some there, like in a, a bunch of NSA projects or the U.S. National Security Agency um, that were that were essentially like joint ventures with Google and other firms in Silicon Valley. And when when we went to, to pitch book. Which is the source that I mentioned on on these these early stage tech firms? PitchBook lists as one of its VC firms, um, like a firm that's very openly, like publicly listed as like an NSA, like a branch of the NSA. It's like you know the the NSA's VC fund um, where it goes around Silicon Valley and and invests in these companies. And actually, there's a lot of back and forth there. Um, and so I think in in certain subsectors, like I'm not going to say it's at the same scale of China. So you're you're totally right, and I think that helps maintain. Sort of the alignment of, of the two under an autocracy, um, but but I think even in in the U.S. you have like a lot of this public private partnership, which generates again massive economies of scope. So like Google Maps was and Google Earth were very much derived from um, partnerships with the NSA, um, and and I, I, that that you know this isn't like a conspiracy theory or something like that, but it's actually I think it's true. Um, okay. It's a real, real fact. So uh, this was great. I think we are basically out of time. There's a couple of additional questions in the chat, but uh, we'll just send them uh, to you directly uh, so you can have the, all the feedback. But uh, overall, thank you everyone for joining into this talk. Thanks Noam for presenting. It was uh, super interesting. And we're yeah. going to have Dan Bernard in two weeks. So I hope we see you there. All right, see you guys. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much.